Welcome to Black in the City of London. My name is Jonathan Goddard and I'm an educator and creative type. I live in London and love finding out about its truths, myths and history. Today I'm inspired by the lives of 18th century polymaths, celebrities and literary sensations. The music that plays us in today is Vive Le Roy, composed by Ignatius Sancho, the 18th century writer, musician and entrepreneur who is considered to be the first black person to vote in an election in England. This is a recent recording played by a brilliant ensemble called Green Ginger. Their music is available from greenginger.bandcamp.com and there is a link to their site and their bandcamp in the show notes. I've also linked a video made by the Early Dance Circle which discussed Sancho and his music. Black in the City of London Today we are going to discuss the lives, habits and cultural artefacts that survived three famous black men who lived in 18th century England in and around the city of London. Sancho, Equiano and Barber. Each one speaks to us about the possibility that it existed for black men to gain status in 18th century Britain, whether because of their talents, bravery, principles or proximity to power and influence. Each of them is widely celebrated in the present day. In this episode, I look at these familiar faces through the places they frequented in the city, what they wrote about themselves, and what we can learn by what was written about them. Yeah, we can learn quite a lot from the writings of black British authors in the 18th and 19th century, but there are, of course, limits as well, because they tend to write uh, about the extraordinary things in their lives rather than the, than the everyday things. There are exceptions to that. Brick and Carey, Professor of Literature, Culture and History in the Department of Humanities at Northumbria University, who has written widely on empire, slavery and abolition. So what we often find out is the stories of people who have, in many cases, been brought from Africa through the Middle Passage uh, in, into slavery, who have often escaped from their enslavement from one way or another. And those are for them, extraordinary moments rather than moments of daily life. But we also find when people uh, come to Britain and they kind of settle into a, a pattern of daily life, if you like, that we can find out more about the ordinary things they're doing. One really good example is Ignatius Sancho, who wrote a number of letters in the 1770s, a lot of which just concern what he and his children and his wife were doing in the shop that he ran there. So Ignatius Sancho is a prototype of the concept of black excellence. You could argue that his life had been a result of the experiment of one of his benefactors, the Duke of Montague. Sancho was born on a slave ship and his parents were enslaved, being trafficked to the port of Cartagena, which is now in North Colombia. But both his parents died when he was a baby. His mother succumbed to disease and his father is said to have taken his own life. Now this poor orphan was taken by his master to Greenwich in London on the southern banks of the Thames. And he was presented to three spinster sisters as a gift. These sisters threatened the child with the return to plantation slavery at every turn. And they gave him the name Sancho, deriving it from the name of the squire in Don Quixote. As fate would have it, it was in Greenwich that he met a neighbour, the progressively minded Duke of Montague, who taught Sancho how to read and saw his intelligence. And he was keen to find out whether African genius was a myth. So he took Sancho on as a test case. His second, in fact, his first having been Francis Williams, a Jamaican that the Duke had sponsored to go to Cambridge University for an advanced education. That happened when the Duke had been the governor in Jamaica, but the Duke wanted to experiment with the limits of the intellectual capacity of a black man. So he took Sancho to his home to read and gave him presents of books and strongly recommended to his mistresses the duty of cultivating a genius of such apparent fertility. When the Duke died, Sancho abandoned his three mistresses, partly it seems because they wanted to curtail his intellectual pursuits. And Sancho went on to appeal to the Duke's widow, Lady Churchill, for financial assistance and help in obtaining his freedom. In her will, she left him £70 and an annuity of £30, allowing him to immerse himself in the arts without being burdened by money worries. <laughs> 
it must have been a truly privileged position. So Sancho threw himself into the arts. He acted at first and was friends with the celebrated actor David Garrick, but his theatre career was short-lived, partly because of a speech impediment and partly through a depletion of his financial resources. In need, Sancho appealed to the new Duke, who took Sancho on as a servant until 1773, when ill health caused him to leave. And it's at this point that Sancho set up his grocery and oil supply in Mayfair at number 20 Charles Street. Sancho lived there with his wife Anne Osborne, a free black woman and their many children, until he passed away in December 1780. As well as being an amateur composer and musician, Sancho is believed to have been the first black person to vote in an English election. And luckily for us, those of us who were interested in what life was like for a black person in his time, he corresponded extensively sending many letters which were published after his death. Sancho was the chief representative of the black British community during his life, advocating for friends, campaigning through his letters to the press and in personal correspondence to end the evil that was slavery. However, it is clear that he was a patriot enmeshed in the British class system, which afforded him status that had been obtained as a result of his relationship to the wealthy and powerful. Black in the City of London It's always difficult in history to find out the details of the lives of ordinary people who don't keep diaries, don't keep journals, who don't make it into the newspapers and so on, who are just doing very private lives. But we do get some indications um, as I say, uh, Sancho and Ecriano particularly have lots of acquaintances and lots of friends. Sancho writes uh, a reference for uh, somebody who'd been working for him and indirectly for um, the Duke because um, Sancho was a butler, which meant he was a, quite a senior member of the household. So he would have employed people himself in turn. So he's writing references for people he'd employed. And that shows us that there are kind of all of these networks and people doing things like looking for work, trying to get good references, trying to move on to new positions and so on. Ignatius Sancho is truly an impressive figure and it's no wonder considering the story of his childhood and his encounters with the Duke of Montague. An early example of what we would term black excellence now. He was an objectively impressive figure and was very lucky to have made it to the position that he did. One that was warranted by his talents and skills. Reading his letters demonstrates his warmth, his love of learning. That means that you can kind of dip in and out and, uh, and, and pick on letters. And some of them are absolutely hilarious. Uh, some of them are very moving. Uh, some of them just recount, as we were saying earlier, the daily life of, uh, of an African shopkeeper as he was when he wrote most of the letters. Uh, but because there are so many of them and, uh, and most of them are quite short, it's a really good book to sort of dip in and, and out of. And it tells us uh, a lot about his experience in the mid 18th century. Let us consider Sancho through his own words. A little reading and writing I got by unwearied application. The latter part of my life has been through God's blessing, truly fortunate, having spent it in the service of the best families in the kingdom. My chief pleasure has been books. Your sermons have touched me to the heart, and I hope have amended it, which brings me to the point. In your tenth discourse, page 78 in the second volume, is this very affecting passage. Consider how great a part of our species, in all the ages down to this, have been trod under the feet of cruel and capricious tyrants would neither hear their cries nor pity their distresses. Consider slavery, what it is, how bitter a draught, and how many millions are made to drink it. Of all my favourite authors, not one has drawn a tear in favour of my miserable black brethren, excepting yourself and the humane author of Sir George Ellison. <laughs> 
Black in the City of London. So we have, um, for example, at Criano, when he comes to London, he has a, a long career as a seaman. So quite often he's talking about his life on board ships at sea. So we get a lot of what, what a historian would call a below decks narrative, because he's not an officer. We get uh, stories about his relationships with other people on board the ships he's at sea with. He goes on all sorts of extraordinary adventures to the North Pole and back to the Caribbean and so on. But there is a lot of that story of daily life. And earlier in his life, uh, when he was enslaved, but uh, he was aboard a Royal Navy uh, warship, we get accounts of what it was like to be in the thick of battle during an 18th century uh, naval campaign. Some of the accounts uh, that he has for uh, some of the engagements in the mid-18th century are the best we have for those battles. Equiano also tells us little details of his life when he's in London. He played music, he went to church, he made friends with quite a lot of people because he name-checks a lot of people and conversations he has. And it's the same with Ignatius Sancho. There are a lot of people that he mentions, a lot of people he writes to, and a lot of people he mentions by name, having visited him in his shop. So we know that um, both of them were part of quite large social networks, as well as getting on with family life and all the other things that we sort of do in everyday life. While Sancho's writing was not abolitionist overtly in the same way that Equiano's interesting narrative was, he often writes movingly about the iniquity of the slave trade. To quote him further, in Africa, the poor wretched natives, blessed with the most fertile and luxuriant soil, are rendered so much the more miserable for what providence meant as a blessing. The Christians' abominable traffic for slaves and the horrid cruelty and treachery of the petty kings encouraged by their Christian customers, who carried them strong liquors to inflame their national madness, and powder and bad firearms to furnish them with the hellish means of killing and kidnapping. Like Sancho, Equiano ended up becoming prosperous enough to live independently in Marlebone. Now, for those who are unfamiliar, Marlebone is in the borough of Westminster now, in central London, close to Baker Street. But at the time, it was synonymous with the wealth of planters, those who had gained money in the colonies, particularly in the West Indies, who came to London and wanted to flaunt it. So, Equiano must have been cheek by jowl, day by day, going to church, going about his daily business, among those who were carrying out the enslaving of Africans and arranging for the finance for it. Black in the City of London. The first time I read Equiano's interesting narrative, I was 11 or 12 years old, and I couldn't get my head around it. I couldn't believe that one person had lived the life that he had. It truly was an inspiring tale. What we learn from Equiano's narrative is that he had a truly spectacular life. I wanted to further explore with Bricken a bit about Equiano's narrative itself, but also about this culture of black people publishing narratives of their lives in the 18th and 19th century and how that fed into abolitionism. Well, I think the first port of call would be a good way of putting it, because it's a very much a maritime book, is Equiano's interesting narrative. It, it, it is interesting in the way that we would use the word today. It's full of lots of detail and things to interest. But it's also interesting in the 18th century sense, in, in that it's moving. So it's, it's both a good read and also something that's actually very, very, very moving. It's quite easily available as well, which is also an advantage. It's been reprinted many times. There are editions available for free on the internet. You can buy edited uh, editions as well very easily. So it's an easy book to get hold of. And it tells this story of how Equiano was born in Africa. There's been a little bit of a scholarly debate about uh, the details of that in recent years, but Equiano tells us the story about how he was born in West Africa. He was captured. He was taken across the Atlantic to America. He then was taken aboard a Royal Navy ship. He was he was enslaved in the Royal Navy. He fought in, in the wars. He later on was able to buy his own freedom. He came to London. He worked uh, in the Navy. And uh, later on in his life, he became an abolitionist. And that story, I've told it very succinctly there, but that story is developed across what I think is absolutely the most important book written by a black person in the 18th century. One of the things that um, is really important to remember as well is that literature had a really big impact on developing people's ideas, not just about 
enslavement, but about everything. There were fewer sort of cultural outlets in the 18th century. There wasn't television or, or radio or cinema. Uh, so uh, people we don't now think of as being particularly important, such as poets, actually had a, a big influence uh, on what people thought and what they talked about at the time. Even through the centuries, literature still has the power to move us and inform us about the lives of representatives of a group who existed in London at the time, who we don't know much from their point of view. We're able to understand their existence through official records, through the paintings that we see, but to really understand what it was like to experience enslavement and then to live as a free Black Britain is a difficult task. We have the writings of Equiano which tell us so much. When we think about London and the city of London, it's clear that Equiano's life crisscrosses these canvases. It's Equiano who brings news of the Zong massacre to the celebrated abolitionist Granville Sharp, the subsequent legal case of which was fought at the Guildhall and centered on the deaths of more than 130 Africans who were thrown overboard from the British slave ship Zong in 1781 when the ship ran low on water. In fact, Equiano and Sharp also collaborated in an attempt to free John Annis. After a life at sea and a time being a hairdresser and taking on other skilled roles, Equiano works as a servant in London. Later in his life, Equiano himself becomes a civil servant, working for the government and a campaigner for the black poor in London arranging an ill-fated resettlement trip to Sierra Leone while he was commissioner for the black poor, a position which saw him take responsibility not only for the black poor, but also for the destitute white women of London living off prostitution. A strange combination, but one which seemed appropriate at the time. When he complains about the corruption of certain officials connected to the project, he is eventually fired from the Sierra Leone role, despite being completely correct in his assessments. Black in the City of London. I was named Oluada, which in our language signifies vicissitude or fortune, also one favoured and having a loud voice and well spoken. I remember we never polluted the name of the object of our adoration. On the contrary, it was always mentioned with the greatest reverence, and we were totally unacquainted with swearing and all those terms of abuse and reproach which find their way so readily and copiously into the languages of more civilised people. The only expressions of the kind that I remember were, may you rot, or may you swell, or may a beast take you. The things that appealed to me as a child were the descriptions of battle and the stories of life aboard ship. Now reading Equiano's narrative and walking the streets of London, particularly as we cross from Westminster to the city and back again, I'm struck by what his view of London must have been like, having had the experiences he did. What struck me about this passage, about Equiano's naming, he's known as Gustavus Vasa, by a name which is not his, as was Sancho, as was Barber as are the countless black people who were resident in the city and London and Britain throughout that time. But because of their literary prowess or their willingness to document their pasts or to correspond, we do know about these particular people in great detail. One event that struck me when studying Equiano is his attempt to rescue somebody who's been kidnapped after the Somerset case, which supposedly settled the idea that you could not be kidnapped and abducted from the country for the purpose of enslavement in the early 1770s. At the sight of this land of bondage, a fresh horror ran through all my frame and chilled me to my heart. A former slavery now rose in dreadful review to my mind and displayed nothing but misery, stripes and chains. And in the first paroxysm of my grief, I called upon God's thunder and his avenging power to direct the stroke of death to me, rather than permit to become a slave and be sold from lord to lord. That's from chapter 5. 
the words stir something in me. We, the themes of academic study are exemplified in this text in profound ways that are both moving and worthy of repeated study, not just by academics, but by people with an interest in the human condition. Tortures, murder, and every other imaginable barbarity and iniquity are practiced upon the poor slaves with impunity. I hope the slave trade will be abolished. I pray it may be an event at hand. Equiano's narrative is so significant because he speaks authoritatively and evocatively on the processes and experience of his enslavement. He also uses his powers of persuasion to exhort his readers to consider and resist the iniquitous nature of the slave trade. His book was published by subscription and was very popular in his time. His initial subscribers included members of the aristocracy and the highest echelons of society. Equiano lectured widely in support of the release of several repressings of his narrative and even jokes about the fact that his work is reprinted abroad without him directly benefiting from it. When speaking of Sancho and Equiano, we speak of men who were of the highest sensibility of their time. They were refined, yet still they faced a hostile environment. And this was not unique to those two, obviously. It was a reality that the thousands of black people living in London at the time were confronted with. When we look at the reviews of Equiano's narrative in the Gentleman's magazine, it acknowledges that he, unlike most men of his rank, deserved to be on a par with the general mass of men in the subordinate stations of civilized society, and so proved that there is no general rule without an exception. So even at that time, the very triumphant story of these gentlemen overcoming was twisted with a racist angle. Black in the City of London. Frances Barber is a fascinating person and really worth a lot of investigation as to his life and his experience here in London in the 18th century. Celine Lupo McDade the Donald Hyde curator and director of Dr. Johnson's house. Um, his relationship to Samuel Johnson was that he joined his household here in 17 Goss Square as a, a servant uh, when he was just 10 years of age. But his life is absolutely fascinating. Francis Barber was born into slavery in 1742 on a sugarcane plantation in Jamaica. The plantation owners, the Bathurst family, sold up and moved back to England with what were referred to at the time as a handful of their favourites, only four of about 200 people. Question mark, you know, was he the illegitimate son of the plantation owner or perhaps he served in a domestic capacity rather than in the plantation, perhaps as a butler or servant of sorts at home and was brought back to England for that reason. We'll never know, sadly. What we do know is that Bathurst's son, and uh, Johnson were dear friends, and both of them were vehemently anti-slavery. A few years later, when Barber was only about 10 years old, he was sent round to 17 Gough Square to act to a degree as Johnson's servant. Uh, the timing of this is pivotal in as much as Johnson living in this house, working on the dictionary, living with his wife, and she passed away and they'd never had servant staff and he'd fallen into a great depression and his friends were concerned about his health. He wasn't receiving visitors, wasn't going out, there was no fresh food in the house, he wasn't eating, he was deteriorating quickly. And so Bathurst, I think in a bid to kind of get him out of his father's household and into the house of a very liberated thinking man who was in desperate need of some attention and care, he sent him round to Gough Square and it kind of worked. Barber would get fresh food on the table. It, it snapped Johnson out of his depression because he was suddenly responsible for a child. And he'd never had children and he'd never had servants. And he suddenly had, had this child to look after. And he, he grew very fond of him very quickly. In terms of Barber's life, it's really atypical, I think, uh, for people in his position, the many people that were brought to England and expected to serve in the household of their plantation owner. 
Um, Johnson would pay for him. He would pay for his education. Whether he wanted to or not, he would become well-versed in writing and reading English, uh, Latin, Greek, quite likely uh, some other European languages too. In terms of what we know about his life and his duties as a servant, they are comparatively quite light. So running a few errands here and there, a bit of shopping, serving on table, answering the door. What we know about him and his life is through the biographies of Samuel Johnson, though. Uh, and so he's a frequent character in the household of Johnson and commented on by people who visit him at home, people who correspond with Barber following Johnson's death to create their biographies. He becomes an immensely important primary source for biographers of Johnson and, and kind of very much respected for that, respected for his education. He has the liberty to go off and take other jobs. So he's living with Johnson he wants to study um, medicine, really. So he goes off to be an apothecary assistant over in Cheapside, the other side of St. Paul's to us here in Fleet Street. He joins the Navy of his own volition for a few years, but he comes back and lives with Johnson in his household and gets married, has children, and is by Johnson's bedside many years later when he passes away and is, very unusually for the time, named as his sole heir in Johnson's Last Women Testament. Barber was like Equiano and Sancho, a boy when he first encountered London and the city. The city that greeted him was bustling with sights, sounds and smells that must have been overwhelming. London in the middle of the 18th century had a population of around 700,000, including several thousand black people, both free and enslaved. A sizable population which is difficult to accurately quantify. Barber came back to an England that had not lost the anti-black xenophobic sentiment that had been present in the time of Queen Elizabeth I, when she instructed the Lord Mayor of the City of London to make provisions for the removal of a relatively small number of black people in Britain. In 1723, it was said of the number of blacks entering the city in the Daily Journal, if they be not suppressed, the city will swarm with them. Johnson caused Barber to be baptised, as Johnson's friends Hawkins put it. This is significant because there was the belief that baptism was a strong argument against enslavement, since one of the justifications of slavery was that it was practiced by well-meaning Christians on uncivilized heathen. Why the name Francis Barber was chosen remains unknown. So I wanted to ask Celine about what it was like for Barber living in the city of London. So in terms of Barber's life in the city, we know that he, he would know it like the back of his hand. He'd be running errands here, going to market here. He studied over in Cheapside, so the, the east side of St. Paul's Cathedral. And he, he worked in apothecaries uh, as a, an apothecary's assistant, effectively. He later joined the Navy, so he left the city. But then he came back and served principally as a servant in Johnson's household. Now, Johnson moved around a lot. Uh, he was only here in off square for just over a decade and so all of the houses that he barber and the, the wider household as it grew lived in were, were always a stone's throw from here so johnson's court that leads into gough square bolt Hall that leads into gough square they're down in, in a temple for a while staples in and so absolutely fleet street and the surrounding tributaries and courtyards and the city of london more broadly would have been francis barber's stomping ground now there is great literature to show that there was a large black presence in 18th century London that included both the enslaved and the free. So I wanted to find out what evidence do we have about Barber participating in the social life of London and his encounters with other black people of the time? So what we can learn about Francis Barber and his interaction with the broader black community here in, in the city of London and, and more broadly is annotated through biographies of Johnson at the time. So there's there's a couple of things I think worth mentioning. One that pops up in James Boswell's biography of Johnson, where um, a chap, a friend of his, uh, pops around to see Johnson and he, he's not at home, he's out. But he reports what he does find. May I read it for you? This is a chap called Baptist Noel Turner, who's popped over from Cambridge. And he says, the doctor was absent. And when Francis Barber, his black servant, opened the door to tell me so, a group of his African countrymen were sitting round a fire in the gloomy anteroom, and they all turned to look at me, and they presented a curious spectacle. That tells us two things, really. One, lots of friends were visiting Barber. Barber was entertaining his friends and the black community that he was part of in his home. And this is quite striking to the person who visits, because ordinarily you wouldn't see a servant of any background 
having a party of their own in the house. And so I think it's it's striking that, you know, this curious spectacle he's referring to is the fact that it's sort of overtaken by people, not uh, Johnson and his own circle of friends, but Barber and his. There's also another time that gets referenced a few years later that, that talks more broadly about a club or a society of sorts. We can't locate it precisely, but it was around Fleet Street area. So this is, again, sort of where Johnson and Barber were living for much of their lives at which 57 men and women were dancing and music was playing, food and drink were part of this as well. So they're just socialising. This is a, a large party, 57 people. And it was exclusively for black people, this society. There were no white people uh, present, no white, you know, it was it was just for them. They had the space. This was probably a tavern or a public house. And this seemed to be a fairly frequent social gathering, part of this society. Evidence, strong evidence of one, a very large black community and one that was very social. And so Barber was absolutely uh, present and, and contributing to that. Sancho, Equiano and Barber were clearly atypical in the relationships they formed, the effect they had and their personal legacy and the way that has survived into the present day. In our next episode, we're going to learn something about those who escaped enslavement in the UK, whose stories were less celebrated and applauded in their own days. And we're going to learn about some of the lesser figures who were trailblazers, particularly in the square mile. My name's Jonathan Goddard. This is Black in the City of London, a podcast about the black experience in the square mile from antiquity until the present day. Our episodes drop on Thursdays every week. Until next time.